tonight, I'm actually going to just let uh, each of the panelists uh, go down the line and introduce themselves and uh, what uh, organization or role uh, or, or institution they are a member of and what their role is here in Appleton Park County. And then uh, then we'll start in on some questions. So, um, go ahead, Officer Chambers. I haven't seen the oh, and we've got oh, microphones. Have, yeah. Microphone check. That's fancy. I am Senior Police Officer Jamal Chambers. I've been with the athens Clark County government for 20 years. I recently returned from the Sheriff's uh, Office. I was an investigator for gangs at the Sheriff's Office here in this role now with the Community Outreach. Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Jerry Salters, uh, athens Clark County Police Department and the Police Chief. Hi, uh, good evening. I'm John Donnelly. I am the circuit public defender, that is, I'm uh, the director of the local public defender's office, and I have basically been uh, with the public defender's office for 29 years um, since uh, law school at UGA. I'm not sure what, uh, I mean, you know, we, we're in the business of defending people who can't afford to hire their own attorney the, in the criminal courts in Oconee and Clark counties in juvenile traffic state court, misdemeanor, superior court, felony cases, and appeals. Um, so I'm not sure what expertise I can provide, but I'm happy to provide whatever perspective I can as someone whose office is in the practice of, um, you know, sometimes representing people charged with uh, gang act, criminal gang activity. Thanks. My name is Mocha Jasmine Johnson. I'm the co-founder of the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement. Um, we have a program called End of School to Prison Pipeline. We provide bailout services. Um, so I'm also an educator, master educator, um, worked in education for over 10 years, worked in GED education for over four years, which was some of the best parts of my life. Enjoy teaching GED classes. So I'm here to talk about the end of school to prison pipeline and um, what we see when we're bailing folks out of jail and anything that I can contribute to conversation to help. That's what I'm here for. Thank you. So I guess we just want to just start off, and and we can you can each contribute. You know what what you might know uh, about this. Um, it might not have to necessarily be even facts and figures so much, but what. How does gang-related crime affect the overall crime rate in athens Clark County? And or what are kind of the general trends that you see? Like, is this, um, is this an area of crime that, that you see trending is increasing or decreasing uh, overall? So just to kind of give people a, a picture of what, of what it is. Sure. So um, whether it's a robbery, or a battery or a criminal street gang act um, is really doesn't really add to our numbers. We have a certain amount of incidents we have. Uh, I can tell you that last year, middle of the year, we seen a huge increase in the amount of shooting and gang violence in Athens. Uh, we increased our numbers in our gang unit, uh, and we started seeing those numbers go down. But we still had a lot of challenges. I think a lot of people know. A couple weeks ago, we had a several shootings that was not gang related, but unfortunately a, a five-year-old and a 14-year-old child were shot. Um, but when we look at crime numbers currently, overall in athens Clark County, we are 9% reduction in the numbers of crimes from last year. And when we talk about shootings specifically, we're down 25% from this time last year. Um, we have a lot of work to do, and how we solve it is through working with our community. Um, that's currently numbers. I don't, I don't think I'm contradicting anything that you're saying, but I, to, to directly answer your question, uh, gang crime is a very small, small percentage of crime in Clark County. Um, there are oftentimes reports in the media that um, several gang members were arrested over the weekend in this operation, and... Um, but they aren't, they're rarely charged with uh, a, what they call um, a criminal gang act that is a crime that's in furtherance of, to advance the 
I guess, goal of the gang. Um, I mean, a lot of these shootings are and are retaliatory for, for uh, some perceived offense or some offense in the gang world. Um, but someone may have been uh, documented with the police department or with other law enforcement agency as having been um, a gang, you know, affiliated with a gang, but just because they're arrested the next time for breaking into cars or a domestic violence incident or something doesn't mean that, you know, ha would have nothing to do with the gang that they may or may not have been affiliated with several years previously, if that makes sense. Um, what, uh, so what overall is like the, the target demographic of gang recruitment and, uh, and what, what like, circuit breakers are there or, or what should there be in place to kind of prevent recruitment overall? So I would tell you, uh, in this community, and I'm from Chicago, Illinois, I was born and raised, we have some issues up there. Um, but here in Athens, it's more like a family, right? Uh, as a former school resource officer at uh, Clark Central, there's a lot of resources. There's a lot of non-for-profits. So what I've learned is the more these young men and young women are involved in those opportunities, the less likely they are to get involved in things they shouldn't be involved in. The problem is we're missing a few kids and they're sliding through the cracks and that's unacceptable, right? Can it be fixed? Yes. Can it be worked? Yes. But partnerships, as the chief will tell you and the deputy chief, we can solve some of these issues. Now, you're not going to solve every issue, but a lot of kids you can address. And it's not always about sports. It could be about science. It could be about reading. The more they're involved in positive activities, the less issues they're going to have. And then rolling into the crime thing, crime is a opportunity for someone. If you leave a cell phone somewhere and they grab it, man, it's actually a crime. Young folks see it, oh, you just dropped a cell phone. That's they lost my game. But it's that we know better than that. But let me ask you a quick survey. Raise your hand if you all know who Snoop Dogg is. Okay. Al Capone for those older folks like myself. Okay. Those are gang members, right? Snoop, Ball, Snoop Dogg wears blue, right? He tells you he's a crip, right? Okay. So if Snoop Dogg slaps Al Capone, does that actually make it gang related? Or is it just two guys who just didn't like each other from opposing sides and they slapped each other? It happens every downtown all the time, Alabama, Georgia. It happens all the time. But we got to just sometimes put too much of an emphasis on certain things and not address what the real issue is, is getting our young men and young women engaged in positive activities and focusing on the betterment of their education. If we do that, we improve our neighborhoods and we improve society. I would say definitely um, the first part of the question is the target demographic areas. So when we're seeing at-risk youth um, recommended to us through our program is usually kids that are living in poverty, marginalized communities, is heavily um, black and minority students that are being recommended to the program or we see that are being incarcerated. In these areas, they're also dealing with poverty issues. They're dealing with um, not having enough parental support. So I saw where we need to create like a village. There's still a broken thing going on within athens Clark County, within even the organizations that provide support. We're not working together. We can't put certain things aside to come together and, and work to benefit the youth. And I don't think one organization or one person can fix this problem because it's complex. When, um, when I meet a student, like one of the students that's been recommended to us, he's like 11 years old, he lost his mom two years ago. He's been acting out, acting out, acting out, acting out. So it's like if we don't create like an intervention, preventive measures, a support system, we're gonna continue losing them. We're gonna continue, they're gonna continue falling through the cracks. And then what I also see is kids that are being bullied under peer pressure. Um, they'll be more susceptible to wanting to be affiliated with a gang for protection. If you are constantly like your like your mom cannot provide for you for whatever reason, that can also be attractive to a young person to be a part of a gang because that's a support system and that's their way of making money. So if we don't figure out how to come together as a community to um, 
to intervene and create a support system for these kids, we're going to continue losing them. But I will say over the past year or so, I believe there has been a decrease. There has been a decrease. Whatever is going on, there has been a decrease. Um, but this issue of gangs and kids, this been coming for a long time. This been going on. We, we've been hearing about this for like over five years from students doing research, but it's like, what are we going to do now? So one thing is holding them accountable for their actions. But another thing is that we have to figure out how to empower these kids and let them know that there's somebody out here that loves you. And one of the hardest things is like, for me, teaching GED classes, some of the people were court ordered to my class. Some of the people had different obstacles that made it difficult for them to, to, to succeed. But it's like you have to like not give up on them and, and deal with conditional, unconditional love dealing with them sometimes. And it's hard. So to get back to your question, elementary is what they're focusing on right now. It's for recruitment. Uh, and the, what, what they're using is their appearance. So let's say you come from a home, you don't have as much. Well, we're going to provide you everything you need if you hang with us. We're going to, as you go into middle school, you're not going to get bullied on because we're going to protect you. You go to high school, you're going to be a part of us. Now, eventually, you're going to do something to earn your keep. Uh, and that's what we have to address. Uh, we have started a program with doing haircuts in the school in the elementary. Uh, but that's just one school. And I'm trying to get other engagements in other schools to do the same thing. Because appearance is everything. That's what they're targeting. Well, the way you, as you said, the way you dress, the way you look, builds into your self-esteem. And everybody wants to be a part of something. Even if they don't, they really do. And they thrive on that. Uh, when you start talking colors and symbols, that's just, just me identifying who I am, where I'm at, and who's going to protect me, and what resources we need. Because in the end, we're, we're talking about resources, those who have and those who do not. And also with, you know, I think they would agree that, um, but hadn't come right out and said it, it's, it's primarily um, black kids in Athens. And um, not 100 percent, but but almost 100 percent, um, which is troubling, obviously, for the just be, that we still live in this world that's got um, you know these sort of separate social worlds going on, um, and I agree uh, that it it is. For the, the exact same reasons I, that I've heard people described for the status and for the sort of security or safety, um, I don't, it's also, um, you know, fairly rampant in uh, prisons, not just in Georgia, but everywhere. And um, so I remember last year I had a case where my client had um, been charged with you know, selling drugs uh, as a, and also with gang activity. And, you know, he was like 39. He said, look, I, I had a joint when I was 19 when I went to prison for a statutory rape charge involving, well, he was 17, the girl was 15, and he ended up marrying her. And it was, uh, uh, he completely got, um, well, I don't know if railroad is the right word, but he, he got, um, mistreated in the justice system, ended up going to prison at 19 and said, I had to, you know, I mean, I was just in fear of my life and in the prison system and, um, and joined. And then, you know, and ever after that, he'd been in and out several times. He said, I'm also an addict. And, um, I end up, you know, I'm, I'm living a criminal lifestyle, but I, it, I've never associated with the gang members outside of prison. When I go to prison, then I, I, I have to put on that sort of cloak. Um, but outside of prison, he doesn't. Uh, but he still, you know, had, had struggles. Um, anyway, I had something else I was going to say, but I'll, it'll probably come back to me. Thanks. Are there, what are like some effective tools that, that either are in place or could be being Put in place in our community that that would compact, you know, would kind of counteract this. I thought it was really interesting about it being so prevalent already in elementary school, and, and so I'm not sure about the also 
I'd say we have a wonderful community with a lot of nonprofits, but it's a matter of taking and getting those nonprofits together. Uh, I know that we've got plenty of representation with them from our commissioners, and I know they're working hard to look at different programs and what can we do, uh, and we've got to do something to give these kids somewhere to go. I know there's after-school programs, but other programs that's later in the evening to keep the kids busy. Uh, an idle mind's a devil's workshop, right? And so I think collaborating, I think what Mocha said, if you can get everybody to come together and don't worry about sides and say we're here for the kids and work together, I think we can, we can make a lot of movement. And, and to add, a, a community is only as strong as its weakest link. I remember some years ago, Mocha did a dance uh, trio with some kids who normally would be doing other things and getting into trouble, but I watched how those young ladies were at the um, – Hot corner festival, and it was hot. It was hot. Uh, but they stayed engaged, right? Uh, chess in the Community is a great program. It keeps you engaged. Um, we can do, as a community, we can do a lot of things, but individually it's taxing, if that makes sense. So if we want to keep them out the legal system, we have to mentor them. We have to give time. For a lot of people, time is a lot. But sometimes if, if I'm going to save a community... I mean, I have to give you all the time I have, I can give you, and then get partnerships. Um, this is, it, it is a complicated thing, but it is a thing that actually can be addressed if we do it together. Remember now, you got to treat this like you're a farmer. What makes a good farmer, right? You put the seed, you plant, and then you nurture. If you're not nurturing them, what's going to happen? I would also say, even when um, Officer Chambers talk about the VIP girls, that was, it's tough. Girls, oh my God, dealing with girls, a group of girls can be tough. And so there were times that I wish I had additional support that I could have said, okay, I see this. Cause you see where a child might be having an emotional or social, like they need therapy. They need different things. There's different things that's going on that it's like they need a social worker. I wish I could be able to provide these things. So all I could do was take them out of their normal environments and bring them downtown and bring them in places they've never been before. And, and it's right here in Athens. And some of them had never been in Morton Theater. And they're born and raised right here in Athens. So it's like, wow. So by taking these kids into these different experiences, you could see how it helped. But it can be taxing. It can be taxing. And so what I'm trying to do now with our end of school to prison pipeline program is provide mentorship. And I'm trying to build it like a group mentorship where it's more than one person dealing with this particular child because you can get burnt out and be like, okay, this is a lot. And then also find um, what I've been doing is trying to find, okay, well, if you're a therapist, would you be willing to give me like a couple of hours per month just to talk to the student? We have another student that's going to do um, the SAT and needs help to, you know, get in college. OK, I know a tutor. So what I'm doing is using all the resources that I know, everybody that knows me and be like, hey, Mocha, I'm like, you can do something for one of these kids. Right. So let's create a support system. And so mentorship, I do see that it works. But I also see that it can burn somebody out. So if we can, like, back to it again, create a system to where, okay, let him go over here or let this child go over here to this particular program, I feel like we can have more success. But also, there's times that there is a child that is being attracted to gangs and we're missing it. So how do we teach the parents and um, the teachers to be able to see it because there was things that was going on in my own family. And if you don't, if you're not from the gang life, you don't know about gang signs. You don't know about gang colors. You don't know about gang symbols. You're a parent that's just working, trying to put the food, put food on the table. Can, you cannot imagine that somebody's trying to recruit your child from elementary school in middle school. You, you're not thinking about that. And they're saying, these are just my friends, but if you don't know how to identify certain things, it can grow in a way that is hard. Once they're in, it's hard to pull them back. Even if you're in a two-parent home, one, it doesn't matter. It's hard to pull them back. So if we can create outlets, support systems, preventive measures, work together collaboratively, mentorship, I do believe that we can help these kids, especially those that live in um, marginalized community and poverty-stricken areas. The, again, I'm, I'm agreeing with the other, 
what people have just said, said to the response to that question. And I would just add that the, the police can only do so much. I think that, you know, they're asked to do more and more. Um, and they, I, I think it would be um, sort of misguided to expect the police department to prevent, you know, ha ha be responsible for preventing kids from getting into gangs. Um, so I agree, you know, we, we, it's got to be more of a community effort. Um, and the, well, you know, and going back to what I was saying a minute ago about <clears throat> the um, prevalence of gang activity in, in institutions, in penal institutions, it's, it's not, you know, a prison, but the Clark County Jail also, um, you know, I don't know, I haven't really heard that, that, that you know, gang activity uh, is is widespread there, but um, they're very understaffed and and uh, you know could use resources to. And I know the commission is very aware of it and and trying to do what they can, and the sheriff is trying to do what he can. Um, but you know, there's there's just sort of a number of agencies and um, places in the community where. That I guess we, we just need to be sensitive that there are um, being you know uh, maximized. I don't know given, given you know operating as as well as they can um, to address all these different issues. So if we look at the recruitment aspect of it. We won't look at what they target. So an impoverished area is a fruitful area because that's a, a place that a parent's probably working extra duty to keep food on the table, keep a house over your head, roof over your head, and clothing on you. Well, while you're doing that, who's watching your kids? You know, back in the day, last kid keys, you lock them in, don't go outside. But now you have cell phones, and that's how they have in contact with them now on social media. They do the music, they do a do posts. The new tagging is online. And so then you see something in the video game, and you say, oh, Fortnite, let me get into this box and go back and forth in this conversation, and now they've been recruited. But that recruiting is also trafficking. You got human trafficking. There's so many layers to this. And then here you are, born in the 60s, the 70s, or the 80s, and you're like, what's going on? Because you're out of touch. And even when you do get in touch, you're still behind. Um, you can put all the filters you want on your phones and your laptops, but the reality is they're still going to have contact with people they shouldn't. You have to teach them. But you also have to have a community that's willing to, to see something, to say something. So if I see something, I need to say something and not be closed mouth about it. One more thing. Like he said that I, I definitely think we have to figure out how to recognize the signs and be able to. Because um, I remember I was looking at something on um, Facebook and the way they were spelling, somebody was spelling something, it was like, why are they not, this is not proper, but they're replacing letters. And those is an indication that that person is communicating. A certain, it's just certain things you have to be aware of. So it's like, if you could catch it, you'll be able to like talk to your child, like talk to them and be like, if somebody approaches you or whatever the talk is, you need to basically, um, how do you get out of it? Because you are pressured too. And they're not prepared for that. And they never, we never had that talk with your kids, you know? So if you live in certain areas, I think in general period, I know it doesn't happen in areas where there's more wealth, you know, where people just standing out and recruiting your kids. But if you live in an area where there's corner stores and you see a lot of people hanging out in corner store, you never know. So you have to teach your kids to build up their muscles because the peer pressure that happens, you're not there. You are not there to man help them maneuver that. And next thing you know, you, you end up in a situation, like Officer Chambers said, now you have to do something to earn all of that, that built up, you know? To add on what you're saying, if you're in the blood game, you spell everything with B. If it's a letter, that's a C, you won't use it because that's going to reference Crips. So they'll change that B. The C to B. It's also a sign of disrespect when they exit, uh, exit out. We offer from time to time in the uh, Citizens uh, Academy 
opportunities to talk to officers one on one and they can explain that to you. Um, I've been on this little rampage and it started with a sh- sheriff back there. And what we did was start going to schools and teaching them about gangs. And I would say if your principal wants it, if he reaches out to the chief, I'll go anywhere and talk about it. But I just don't come by myself. I bring people who have specialists in certain with certain gangs and we come in and we, we focus on the issue. We try to teach you what to look out for, but we don't want to overwhelm you because trust me, it can be overwhelming. You don't need to go to an Atlanta Falcons game and talk about everybody is a member of a game because they all got red on. And, and I watched how that guy. It can, it can get deep. Uh, but you also got to understand that game members will use that material from different sports teams to signify who they are. They also do hand signs. They'll do handshakes. They'll do anything to connect so that you know. They'll do clothing. They'll do gym shoes. They even go as far as food. So when you realize that's going on and you start watching your elementary child and then understand who's that elementary child's mentor, because watch out, it may be a high school mentor who has contact with your child. It might have happened during sports or some activity that you had to run late from. Remember, there's always somebody watching your child, even when you're not watching your child, because a gang can only prosper through the people it brings in. And if they don't have members, they can't grow. You don't see it so much in well-to-do neighborhoods because they have resources. And you, your child is so busy into swimming or wrestling or soccer or volleyball that they don't have time to do anything. And when they're doing that, they have tutors. Well, if you're uh, in a community that doesn't have much, you don't have those resources if they're not provided to you free. And so even if they're provided free, you have to pay attention to who's the person who is involved in your child's life. You have to be an investigator. Oh, you can tutor my child, but who are you? Where do you come from? What's your credentials? Because if you do not, trust me, you might be opening a window for something. Of course, all that, like, those the, those things we talk about associated with gangs, those are, that's very attractive to young people. Teenagers love, you know, to have their own language and their own slang and their own way of spelling words and their, you know, manner of dress and secret handshake. And you can just go over to Fraternity Row and find all that here on Millage um, and the secret handshakes they have at the fraternity houses and whatever. Um, but obviously, so there, there is some universality to it. Um, it's just they, they form together in cliques for, um, well, I guess it, it might not all be about criminal activity, but of course, um, when you don't, you're challenged for the resources, um, you resort to other means to acquire them. Okay. I feel like you've, you've done actually, you all have done a great job of, of uh, explaining a little bit more about what, um, what might make a gang appealing to a young person. And I'm personally quite shocked about the elementary school age. I mean, the, um, but could, you know, I feel like, you know, we all hear the term, like, you know, gangs or whatever, but what, what's kind of the more of the, what's in it for the gangs? I mean, what's, what's the, what's the economic, uh, kind of basis of how the gangs work? I mean, there's a lot of money in it. What? Money. Well, I mean, I know money. They make but, I mean, money but, in it but, and it's power. You have power. You have a lot of power. You have money and you have power. And it, and just to put it, just to add to it, just because somebody's in a gang, that doesn't mean they're a killer or they're committing crimes. I was in the military. And when I was in the military, I was surprised to find out, oh, you from a gang. And then they found out, okay, this person is in a gang. And if they're affiliated, they click up in certain ways. Not that they're committing any crimes, but it like follows you for life. You know, so you have an instant group of in the military. Um, if you, oh, you instant click, instant brotherhood, instant friendship, power. The more people you have, yeah, money. Fraternity, right? I mean, so it's no it's. Well, I'm, I'm not, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. These are people that have that previously were a part of gangs. Some of them even wanted to change their life so bad that that's why they went to the military. Right. 
They're like, I got to get out of here. I remember a female that was in New York and the, the way she lived and what was going on with her. And she was already Philly a week gang. She left. But does that mean all of that is out of her system? So they're not active gang members like, you know, performing in them, but they have the background that when they came in, this is this was a part of them already. Add on, you play the influence game. So we just had a Super Bowl not too long ago, and the halftime show was uh the emphasis was on LA rap. Everyone in the halftime show wore blue. Everyone was affiliated with the Crips. The NFL didn't catch it. Right. <laughs> they didn't they catch, didn't catch it. it. They did the Crip walk, yep. they threw up Crip signs, and they played Crip music. And no one caught it. But you got to understand, this has been normalized. One of the hottest shows on TV is Sons of Anarchy. That's gang-related. One of the greatest gangsters of all time was Al Capone. That's gang-related. So you normalize stuff enough, and kids see that that's a popular thing. They want to latch on to it. That's just the society we live in. Can we make adjustments? Yes, we can. Do we want to make adjustments is the key. Nowadays, if it's not bothering me, I turn my... I, and I look the other way. Now I turn my eye back and now it's living across the street from me. Now I have a problem with it. Now I want resources to get rid of it. But if I help the community that's struggling with it, in fact, does that not help me also? So I want you to start thinking as a community, if your brothers on the east side are having issues, then you need to be sort of supporting them on the east side. That way it won't come to the west side. But if you don't believe me, look up in Chicago. Trust me, they're struggling. 16-year-old kids have... We call it bodies, eight bodies on their name. Imagine that a 16 year old has killed eight people and he does a rap video about it. And now he's more popular than president of the United States. That's because we didn't address it because it didn't bother me because it wasn't at my back door. Now it's at my back door kicking it down. Now I have a problem with it and I'm begging the police department to help me. And so they come in heavy handed and now everybody's mad at them when you had resources in that community that would have helped you, but you didn't lean on them. Now, some say it's too late. I don't think it's too late, but you're really pushing the edge. Are there parts of Athens that, that are seeing more of this, like different community, you know, different areas, neighborhoods, communities that we should be focusing more on? I think we have certain neighborhood gangs, and we'll see certain areas that will flare up. But when we look at our incidents and shooting incidents and look at a map it's all over because the kid may live in one area but he knows that the person he wants to shoot at lives in on the west side over in Huntington or and so we're seeing these incidents so it's not really set to one neighborhood this is all over the community so we can't just say you know map it and we know that on this area we're probably going to know because it's all over and they're not they're going other places to shoot and do things and so I'm so glad you said that because people might think that is like this particular area and then it's like they don't get the resources or support or they're condemned or looked down on. And what I'm noticing is that there's a lot of moms that live in those areas. They don't want it. They don't want the the gang activity. They don't want the fighting. They don't want all of that. And it's and they're being consumed and being put under this umbrella of this is all bad. And it's not, you know, so I'm glad you expressed that, you know. So um, recently, SB 44 was signed by the governor and will take effect later this year. And this increases the minimum sentence for gang recruitment of minors and for street gang offenses. Um, uh, is this, do we think that this is going to be effective? What kind of tool can this be? Um, if not, you know, what might be some of the pros and cons? So, I'm sure. I would tell you that every tool is a good tool, but don't abuse a tool. When I went to the conference, I was permitted to go to the conference in Chicago, you, and they said this one thing, you can't, you can't prosecute your way out of a problem that you created by ignoring it. Think about that. You knew it was lingering, and you said nothing. Uh, your officers asked for assistance and resources, and you said, okay, we'll see what we can do about it. So you let it linger, and it became worse. So then your community folks came and said, hey, we got a problem over. These guys are hanging on the corner. 
We don't want him on the corner. He said, well, we'll see what we can do about it. And so now those same guys said, well, if you're going to let me hang here, I'm going to hang over there also. And he said, okay, okay. Well, let me call the chief. Chief, you better come fix this. He said, well, I told you I needed more resources, so I'm, I'm trying to get the community folks involved. Well, you need to get it done now. But we knew it was lingering. We knew it was a problem. So now we're trying to address it. Uh, as a SRO at Clark Central, I had 1,700 kids, and I only dealt with 30. But on Fox 5, you think that 30 was 3,000. Think about that. Most of those kids go to school. They achieve well. They start families. I love them when I see them. They give me hugs. But we forget them because they're just average kids, and they're supposed to do that. So they're not getting the encouragement. But the ones who are constantly getting in trouble, you give them all the resources, but not the proper attention. I will also say I don't think that the bill is going to help because just taking a, even a more stricter and a punitive approach and throwing kids in jail and making it harder to restore uh, or empower these kids, I don't think that is um, going to help us. And so until they address poverty and the housing crisis and we're creating bills that can um, reduce the poverty that is in this Ath in Athens Clark County, I see a, a, an increase over the past couple of years with maybe, you know, um, kids acting out. But at the same time, we have a homelessness issue and people are living in hotels and some of these kids have to go to school every day. So until we are addressing that appropriately, um, creating this type of bill, I don't see how it's, it's going to fix it, especially when we know, compared to all the crime, it's a, law, it's a small percent. This is not Chicago. He know about Chicago, the real deal. This is not Chicago. This is not Atlanta. It's a very small percentage, but it's going to get some kids caught up that are not a part of gangs. It is. Because now, let's say a child at a young age get a tattoo of a gang on their arm. Let's say a group of girls or a group of boys get into a fight. It's not necessarily gang related. They shouldn't have been fighting collectively and jumping somebody. But you can actually be charged in a way that it's going to be harder for you to reclaim your life and have a second chance. I know I've worked with some kids that I'd be like, if you don't get out of my classroom right now, or I'm going to call your mama, or, oh, my God, let me walk out this room right now. But it's just I understand some of these kids are off the chain, but just throwing them in jail and, and not having other resources there for them, not working to try to empower them and pulling them back out, not making sure that these communities are properly funded, not making sure the school system is properly funded and having the education services that they need, not making sure that the teachers in the classroom have the assistance that they need so they can be able to teach and still deal with behavioral issues until they make sure that certain things like that is in place, these bills is not going to help us. Yeah, I mean, I don't expect it to be too much of a problem in Clark County because the public defender's office will be there to pr protect these people. But no, um, but it will be, it could be... Um, in the Atlanta area, um, and I agree. It's it's you know I mean it's sort of the uh, uh, an, an uncreative politician's go-to move, right? Hey, let's increase the penalty for some crime that's been in the news this year. Um, the increasing the incarceration for. Drugs didn't work, um, you know, the war on crime when we won that. When year did we win that? I can't remember. Um, no. you, know, the, um, you know, you can incapacitate people for a, a certain amount of time, but nobody knows the magic number um, to do that that doesn't then become harmful to them and their families, and, um, and nobody knows that. And, and it's, uh, we have to be very careful about... <clears throat> incarcerating our fellow citizens, and um, I'm not saying, you know, never, but but we have to be very careful about it. Um, so I don't see that that's going to accomplish anything. Um, and I also, you know, with that, I would hope that a community would, would keep in mind that um, money by, might be better spent not on a, you know, specialized gang prosecutor, um, but 
those resources could go to, you know, mentors in the schools or whatever, you know, there's the, the $250,000 that a DA might request for a gang unit could go to, you know, that could go a long way at the four middle schools in Athens. Um, but anyway. I, I did think it was interesting your comment towards the beginning about that just because somebody, you know, robs a convenience store and they have a tattoo on their arm that might affiliate them with a gang doesn't make the robbery a gang, you know, offense. So yeah, we, I, we had a case a few years ago. I think you may have been involved in investigating it. It was, it was uh, three people were charged, and they were from different gangs with, with robbing uh, a gas station. Um, and I was like, okay, well, you may be able to prove that these guys robbed it, but uh, the information is that they were all in different gangs at one point in the past, and, and I, I don't know that um, this is... This prosecution for gang activity is is necessary in this particular so when, case. So when you look at the prosecution for gang activity, there's there's a lot of levels of it. The most important thing is the training that you get. We do get training for it. The issues they have in Atlanta, Chicago, New York will not be the same issues that you have here in Athens. Will that bill be effective in Atlanta? It probably be real effective because they they're dealing with YSL right now. But will it be good here in Athens? Maybe not so much because we have a different thing. A lot of our kids are so related to each other. Mm -hmm. That's what we're dealing with. Yep. So, and as Chief said, every, it doesn't make everything gang related, but sometimes it is. And so, because you have such a great community people love and it's prosperous to them, you're starting to get folks starting to migrate here. And so, when they migrate, they bring their habits with them. The goal for us as a community is to teach our kids to withstand that migration. Because they don't, they will be lost to that bill. That bill will be effective. But like you said, you wind up grabbing the wrong kids and not the ones who brought that mentality here. The bill was to target those adults who come from prison who won't let their lifestyle go. And then they come here and they recruit your kids. And they recruit them with such a, a love for the game that they instill that in them. So growing up, um, and, I'm, and there's a confusion about gangs. Most people think people in gangs are stupid. They're not. I, a friend of mine was going to Southern uh, University, which is home of Salukis in Illinois. When we were there, I seen two guys. I said, wait a minute, something's not right. They both wear red jackets. Uh, they had the hats turned to the left. They're vice lords. And I asked him, I said, I talked to him. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, this is how it works. He said, we're not foot soldiers. We have high IQs, so they sent us to school. We'll never right. touch any product. Right. We'll never cause any threats. I'm going to be a lawyer, and he's going to be a doctor. Yep. They need lawyers and doctors just like you do. There's a confusion about this because if you look into the mafia, they did the same thing. Right. These gang members said they have learned from the mafia. They've learned how to be successful by keeping those who they see as intelligent out the mix. And they let them become citizens and they go to academies and they do everything they're supposed to do as citizens until one day they're called upon for the gang. So that bill can be effective, and it right. will be effective in Atlanta, but just because it's effective in Atlanta doesn't make it effective here in Athens. But don't forget now, we have people who migrate here, so it will be effective against them. And I mean, from what I've been hearing, and I mean, I'm not going to lie, it's like being a teacher, you, you know people that are affiliated with gangs. And just because they are, that doesn't mean they're bad people, and I still have to engage with them, and, and they're not causing any harm. But um, I would say even dealing with that particular bill, the main thing is that it ties the it ties all of our hands. It ties the police officer's hands for making a decision of like, OK, we want to prevent we want to present this alternative. It ties the judge's hands from saying, OK, we, we might want to do um, a, a no cash bail for this particular situation. It ties Athens, Clark County, our small town hands of taking more of a restorative approach to addressing this issue as opposed to, and that's what I see with the criminal justice system. I'm not saying that officers and all these people necessarily always have the time to be able to decipher who's bad and who's gonna cause harm. They have to make sure they're safe, okay? But 
once that part is over with, the judges and people that are involved in these kids' lives should happen, have, should be able to make a decision that's more restorative than punitive. And this bill ties their hands from doing that. Well, I'm going to open the, up to the floor for questions. And uh, I will, uh, uh, ideally, I will just take uh, a question from one person until we've had a chance for a lot of people to have uh, their questions answered. So I will. I've heard different people trying to work on this list. It's, I don't think it's been um, published yet, but I think that it's something maybe we all need to start working on and make sure it happens and probably have it listed, whether on the school website, but somewhere to where people can have access to it. But have y'all heard about the list? Have y'all? No. Uh, one of the commissioners, Commissioner Fisher, had a community meeting and where people got to talk at the church. Mocha was there. And I think at the end, one of the action items was try to get that together and try to get so we know what resources are out there and how we can help those resources. And, and again, work with those resources because there's so many that a lot of times we don't know, but we know certain groups, we, we try to work with them to solve issues. I probably volunteers. I don't know who you would need to contact, um, but I know Dexter. I had started a conversation. A lot of us was like, "We need a list. We need a list." And then I don't know who was supposed to create the list. So maybe we should ask the mayor. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to tell you this. We have, um, we're dealing with, at some, we have two programs. We have Teen Social Justice and we have End of School to Prison Pipeline. That's definitely direct mentorship. So transportation is an issue. So we have someone picking up kids sometimes, the ones that are 16 and 17. I'm, the, trans, the bus system is free and these kids don't want to get on the bus. You know what I mean? So the main thing is that um, I have noticed because of the internet and the way technology and the information that they have access to, it is not easy to engage these kids. Like, it is really not. So you have to figure out what that thing is that they're interested in and try to direct them that way. Because if they're not interested in it, you're going to lose them anyway. I've been through it in so many different ways. So my thing is finding out what is that thing that they're interested in or piques their interest. And then also, like I said, it takes a village to raise a child. So whatever services or skill that you can provide a nonprofit or organization, maybe you can provide some transportation and the parent will sign the waiver and say, yes, that's okay for somebody to transport a kid. Whatever service or skill that you can offer, offer that. You know, um, so that's what I would say is not just about getting them to the program. It's finding that program or that that particular thing that they're interested in enough that they will attach to. Yes, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to ask you So how do you guys, if you plan on doing it, 
plan on addressing that issue? Okay, I will tell you this. A lot of people don't know the work that we do. We provide trans, we pay for, I'm familiar with a lot of them families. And as far as our role, what we can do, we provide housing as far as paying for hotels for families with their kids to stay in those hotels. There's a mom that even called me last week, her car broke down, things like that. So if I could pay for her to stay in one more night, but the thing about it, right, we could pay for a family to stay in the housing in a hotel for seven days. Then there's larger organizations with bigger pots of money. So we sign up, sign a form, say after seven days, you're we try to be we try to play our role as transitional housing because that is a big problem. When I ran for office, I was trying to bring attention to the housing crisis. So I'm trying to play my role, and everybody needs to play their role. But I would say this. You do see a lot of kids struggling. When kids are moving around from place to place, that's another way that kids can fall in susceptible gangs. When families are staying in hotels, there's other people staying in those hotels too that there's susceptible gangs. So we all have to play our role. We, we up here in the government, I think that that's a governmental question, but Transitional housing is how what we have been doing. If I can provide some type of resource for that family just to, so they can get by for a week or two until they can get to another agency that can pay for long term housing, if we can sign a letter so they can get a voucher. But the, so a lot of landlords are not even accepting the vouchers. So that is a heavy loaded question and it's very complex and it's nothing that we up here can fully fix. Not even close. Uh, it's, 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 it's a serious problem. Even people we bail out of jail, we have to provide housing for them because if we don't, they're going to be back in the streets. They can get arrested for soliciting. It's a lot. Then we see people with mental issues. They can't get housing because they, can't, they need help with understanding how to pay their rent and their bills. There's one man, they paid for his whole apartment, put him in there, and because he was dealing with something mental, he burnt it down. So it is, this is a complex issue that I don't think that myself or anyone up here can really address. And we need to start talking to our state legislators. That's where we need to focus on. But we don't see it. We don't, we don't see it. They're, they have, they're doing things that's going to hinder us, and especially black boys and young black girls from thriving in this community. Because a lot of the families that are being pushed out are black families. They're marginalized families. So that I just want to tell you, that's a heavy loaded question, Yolanda. The, you said I think there's going to be a, a forum. I think that's going to be the topic of a, a forum later this summer, right? It's actually, we are uh, hopefully going to have that as a topic for a future. Uh, what? October. 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 she has a group and she has the right support system it will help even if it's one mother if she has the support system that she need we just have to help these people we can't just let people become homeless and turn our backs because it is a crisis it's going to bite Athens oh it's going to bite Athens so bad if we don't figure out how to address the housing crisis Oh, 
Okay, so that that all depends on what happens. So let's say that we have a altercation that takes place in the home in front of children, and it's a violent altercation or something that needs to be brought to their attention. Uh, the school normally jumps in; they'll let us know, and then we also will send a uh, referral to DFACS. That's one way. I want to say something. There's a gentleman named Rodney Robertson who does community engagement, and he literally keeps me locked in to what's going on with all the schools. Um, she was able to come out and speak to the kids, and let me tell you something. We got some intelligent kids at gang school. They're very pronounced with their words. No, he works for the school district, and he's very good at what he does. Um, one issue is when we can get young men a haircut, and the young First time he doesn't talk. This kid doesn't talk. He talks that time. He said, you know, sometimes I don't sleep at night. I said, you don't sleep at night? He said, yeah, because I woke up and uh, a gentleman, I, I woke up and a bullet was in my wall while I was sleeping. Well, I brought that to the chief. We, we brought in extra patrol. Um, I believe that we've addressed that issue in the community, but that aggravates me and I don't like that. Somebody's nine years old. He can't sleep because some adults can't get their stuff right that you do is shoot and in the name of a gang, if it's a gang at all, or is it just a personal thing that you never learned how to work it out, so you grab the gun and you shot? We can go into the gun thing, but the, in, in the end, we're talking about adults who are not responsible. They do irresponsible things, and it traumatizes these children. And once you traumatize somebody, there's no coming back from that. You can give all the therapy you want to, but if they become angry enough, then they strike back. And then that's that cycle we talk about. And if they're not big enough, they go get the help of other people. And then they strike back as a group. That's that gang stuff we're talking about, right? It's only going to be prevalent until we, as a community, say, if it's not going to happen on the west side, it's not going to happen on the east side. I stand with you. We stand with the police department. We stand with all the services up here to stop it. We can stop it together. We can minimize it because you'll never stop human behavior. You can just push it to somebody else's community. I don't want it in this community at all. Not to not Madison County and Oglethorpe, don't get me wrong, but I'm, I'm worried about Clark County, right? So I think everything we're doing here, we're talking about, we need to talk about more. We need to bring in more resources because you're correct. If you have nowhere to live, and I know it's from Southside Chicago, then I'm going to take something that I need to get what I want, and you're not going to be able to stop me. But if I address it now and we see all the cues and we use all the, the, the tools we have, then we can do something about it. This is a issue that we can address, but there's so many communities that didn't address it and now they're catching it. I don't think we should be that community. We've had incidents downtown. Here's the thing. Those people weren't from here. They were from other communities. They saw each other downtown. They got into it. And it, oh, it hadn't been gang related because it happened in someone else's community. But this was the tipping point here because now we are a metropolitan area that's very popular. Go dogs! Two championships, about to be a third. That's the reality. <laughs> but we got to think about that. We're bringing great folks to spend money, but we're also bringing other folks looking to take money. And it's not always game related, but it could be a callous to game behavior. Can I ask a question um, that you touched on just a second ago, but we hadn't really addressed it? But um, you know, handguns are a very scary problem in y'all's line of work, right? Um, any thoughts on that? And um, particularly what um, I'm thinking of is that we see, you know, as public defenders, and Ms. Carter will back me up on this, we, we see a lot of police reports in, in our cases. And um, it's Shocking to me how often I'll see a report of a burglary or an entering auto where someone's gun was taken out of their truck or their car or, um, you know, garage. And, but there's no penalty for that, is there? If you have a gun in your glove box in an unlocked car and someone steals it and then they go shoot somebody in Athens with it, the, the person who essentially passively circulated that gun has no responsibility, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, there's no legis legislature. It's not against the law if you leave your uh, firearm inside a vehicle. And then when it gets stolen, just to give you a statistic, last year in athens Clark County, smallest county in Georgia, we, we recovered over 300 firearms, illegal fire firearms. So when I say illegal, I'm talking it wasn't 
they were stolen or they weren't possessed legally, and so we seized them. And uh, some communities turn around and sell those guns back to make money. Uh, in athens Clark County, we destroy them all. So we take them all and, and get rid of them. But we have a huge issue with, with the amount of firearms and specifically how young people uh, get firearms. And specifically, when we look at shell casings from a shooting scene, we're not seeing pistol rounds as much. We're seeing large caliber rifle rounds, 7.62 and 5.56. And that's bigger than anything that our officers carry. Um, and so that, that is concerning at that level. And a lot of these firearms, ARs and things of that nature, are being stolen out of vehicles and burglaries and things of that nature. So. What's, what's the law? Is it that we can all carry guns now without if, Unless you're prohibited. Yeah, I, I assume that you are, all, are packing. Like, <laughs> yeah, and, and unless you're prohibited, yeah, unless you're prohibited, and and the, it, there's not necessarily it doesn't have to be concealed anymore as long as you're not a con uh, just can't go to the Capitol building with it because the legislature that's that's where they draw the line. It's like where they work, you can't, can't carry it. <laughs> Commissioner hat on for you all. Um, it's kind of a two part, but you know, we've, we've, we've heard a lot about the description of the issue. You know, broadly speaking, you know, violence, gang involvement stemming from poverty, lack of support. You know, generally, what I've heard is you can kind of summarize people getting involved in gangs for some combination of needing protection, uh, needing <coughs> affiliation, you know, some kind of connection to other people. So protection, connection, and money. Um, and generally speaking, we've heard kind of like, we need to invest in the market, you know. But the reality is that we have only so much we can do in a given day or week or year. There's only so many dollars to go around. There's only so many policies that can be reviewed by a legislative body in a given legislative session. Um, so, so thinking from the more empowered place of the local government, right, because there's no state legislators here as far as I'm aware, I, I'd be very curious to hear y'all's thoughts. If you could just pick one each of a funding recommendation and a policy recommendation that you think would be an especially impactful or transformative place to start. Um, and just a, a tiny bit more background, so when I say policy recommendation, that's something within the purview of the local government, um, or I know we have some school board members here, and or the school district that you think would, would make a difference to interrupt gang involvement, um, or, or whatever else to break up that school division plan. And then on the funding side, I'm specifically thinking about how we've got this $7 million of uh, unexpended money that's currently designated generally to youth development and violence prevention. Um, and so, you know, what are your thoughts on like, how to spend money in an effective way that's kind of only a long-time source? I, I would tell you this. You can't spend anything unless you actually physically understand the problem yourself. So if I can get you to come to the east side, mm -hmm. right, and just... Look, observe. If I could then can get you to go to a school and walk around and look and observe, then you'll fix the problem. I'm going to fix it for you because you have to see it first. See, people tell you all day what needs to be fixed, but you'll never capture it up here until you actually see it for yourself. See what the people who are struggling with it are going through, and then you can fix that problem and address it where you need it. We got plenty of officers that the chief will put you with. You can do ride-alongs. You can ask questions. And I... I I think Dr. Gant will probably have some teachers who would love to talk to you. You may want to run, but they'll talk to you. But you have to see it first. You, you have some lawyers here who would love to sit down and talk to you about the problem. But me telling you how to fix it is not going to help unless you can see it visually and then experience it. Go there at night and see what the business owners are going through, uh, the homeowners are going through when they're talking about this, 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 and that. Go to Millage Five Points and see the traffic they're complaining about, right? Go to the schools and say they don't have enough supplies. So, so if, I, if I may, if we can just assume that I've already done that, and I'm just asking you person to person, like, what, what do you think would be, you know, I, I get suggestions from literally thousands of people in a year, right? And so as the four, the four of you featured in this event, I just love to hear your thoughts on, like, this is really the thing that I think would make a difference. So the difference I would tell you is I work Monday or Friday. I want you to be with me Monday or Friday, and we'll fix it. That's the best way I can tell you. Now. You got to listen to my music in the car, but we'll fix it. <laughs> and I like R&B, slow, but I mean, I like you like that. But we'll fix it. 
I mean, that's a complex, like, just to give you one answer, like, okay, so you're saying policy? It's, it's at the point that I'm tired of coming to these meetings because we talk and we have the conversation, but what we're trying to tell you is that we need people. We need people. We need bodies. We need. It's not just about the money. The money is there. It's going to be um, distributed to all these programs. The issue is not going to be cured. So it's a long-term type of goal that you're trying to set out for. So I think that is a more like in-depth question where we set aside time and brainstorm because it's even if I say this policy change, when COVID hit, that changed everything. You know what I mean? The homeless crisis. That's that's also the root of it. So I would definitely say that um, continue trying to fund as many of these nonprofit um, that's already doing the work. Stop reinventing the wheel. There's agencies that's out here already doing the work. If you could save, if you're one organization, you could save 10 kids. That's better than none. But it's like all of us is fighting for that money. And it's not enough. So, like I said, support the people that's already doing the work, that has a track record that's showing that they're already doing the work. And it's not just one organization. You can play chess and community all day. But if somebody's homeless and hungry, what organization is there for that? If a young girl has been raped, what organization is there to address that? Who is there to help this person? So it's not just one answer. And all I can say is just keep funding these, find the money, fund the organizations that's doing the work, that's actually doing the work. And it's not about just a hundred kids inside because you can have a better impact with that kid, the mom, and the whole family when you're working with only 10 kids or 20 kids. So some of y'all is looking for organizations that have a hundred children. But I feel like I build a relationship with the mother because it's a holistic approach you have to take. The parent needs help. The teachers might need help. You might have to go up to the school to deal with the teachers. You understand? She might need groceries this week. So we're dealing with, we're trying to take a holistic approach and the parents have to be invested, not look down on and pointing the fingers at the parents. So... Fund the organizations that is already doing the work. And when it comes to policy changes, y'all have to do something about these state legislators that is creating these horrible, harsh bills that's going to lock half of these kids up and still not creating policy changes to address the homeless crisis and these other things. So I know the mayor and commission meets with the, the legislators at some point in time. Y'all have to tell them y'all is not helping us. Yeah, I'm guessing that they have said something in a very polite way uh, that probably falls on deaf ears because there's probably, a, I can imagine, a big disconnect between our local delegation and the state representatives. But um, I sense that you want something more concrete than, than the other two panelists have, have given you so far. Um, and I don't know that I have anything that's very good, but maybe like some sort of county funded social worker at each of the four middle schools to be in some sort of gang, you know, inter intervention position. I don't think that would be a good title, but um, the certain communities like Clark Gardens um, have, could use some attention, cleanup. Um, I don't know what, I don't know why, how they get in such disrepair and it just, probably breeds stress and, um, and crime. Um, but I don't know that the county can address those neighborhoods. Um, and, and I'm sure that maybe they have, and, and it's difficult to, to, to do consistently, but those are the two things that come to mind. Opening up all them community centers. You yeah. had your chance. I know, right? They did. Oh, you're back in on you, though. <laughs> community centers. centers. Community centers. Thank you. <laughs> So on a, a policy standpoint, uh, I'd say collaboration. Uh, we live in a wonderful community that has these great nonprofits that want to help. And how do we support them and bring them together? 
Um, you know, historically at the police department, we look at this past year, we've had three major issues that we felt facing the community. Uh, one being homelessness, second being uh, opioid crisis with the amount of overdose deaths we suffered last year, and then also shootings. Um, and what we want to do is, yes, we're the police, and yes, it's our responsibility to enforce the law, but how do we work with the community? Because our greatest crime-fighting tools are the eyes and ears of the community, and we depend on that our community for that. And we don't want to be in a situation where we're policing the community. We want to police with the community. What does that look like? Um, when we get something going, when a group wants to do something and really help kids, we want to be there with them. Yes, we're going to enforce the law, but how can we also partner to mentor if it takes reading a book to a kid? But it's got to be a a, a, a group effort. It's going to take the entire community to do that. So I'd say that policy has to deal with collaboration between a lot of different groups that care deeply for this community that hurt two weeks ago when that five-year-old child lost her eye to, to violence and that other 14-year-old was shot. We got to have something that, that's going to address those issues. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I have a question about the, um, the homelessness uh, subject. So, um, as you said earlier, like there are resources, like direct resources, that will help these families pay their rent. Like the Georgia Rental Assistance, they recently had a program where they were paying up to 18 months of people's rent. However, there are so many landlords who have availability that are not accepting these payments from Georgia Rental Assistance. So that's one problem. Like, first of all, how is that legal and ethical? And number two, how can you guys collaborate as the leaders of our community to encourage these landlords to accept these um, payments? Commissioners, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I can tell you I had the privilege of being at a work session last week, and, and, and there's a lot of work being done on that. And if you get a chance to watch some of those meetings or even attend them, um, there's a lot being done. If, if you all want to elaborate, you can. I mean, pro probably one of our many bureaucratic components to pay attention to would be GIC, which is the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing. Um, but that's the advisory body on the strategic plan for the affordable housing part of, okay, so we, we set in motion a bunch of things with the ARPA money, the American Rescue money, and two things that kind of happened in parallel was this homelessness strategic plan and the affordable housing strategic plan. And there's two different um, organizations that have been contracted with to run those. The idea is those are going to talk to each other. And so the homeless coalition is the main advisory body for the homelessness one, which is being run by this group called Cloudburst. And then GIC is the main advisory body for the affordable housing one, which is run by this organization called HRNA. Um, so without sending you down the rabbit hole of like watching tons of meetings or attending meetings that you can't necessarily speak at, uh, like, a, like a basic just kind of like cursory, like looking at where those um, plans are and recommending into them that forum that um, Tim mentioned is uh, actually an opportunity to literally like impact what's going to be in that affordable housing strategy. I think what's really important to think about both of these is that they're partially about how to spend the ARPA money, but we all know that that's like a one-time thing, it's going to run out. The, the bigger impact here, when we talk about long-term transformative solutions, is you know what does this recommend as the priority things that we're going to carry forward in our year-to-year -year budget and when we're guiding our, our policy decisions. Um, so I, if, if you're asking me for my take on what we should do with all that. The thing that's most important to me right now that I want to see is how those two plans talk to each other, specifically around supportive housing, which is what's often needed for the people who are chronically unhoused, and is often what's left out of, like, like a, an explicit requirement in affordable housing projects. We talk about income level, but not about what other like, wraparound services people might need to succeed in that housing. Um, and then the other thing to look for is what's called LIHTC credits, which is low income housing tax credits but they're, um, so you'll hear people say LIHTC. Um, and what we really have seen fall off in recent years is landlords accepting those things. And there's some things that I think we're gonna get recommendations around that we can do legislatively to start to see more private development include those voucher programs so we start to see a greater supply of those in the community. I hope that was it's clear. It's really become an issue because like, I personally have been experiencing uh, like 
um, trying to find somewhere affordable or like I've had rental assistance but I couldn't use it because the places that had availability were not accepting it and the places that were accepting the vouchers didn't have any availability. Yeah. And like the people who are affected, they're not here yeah. to learn about these um, just, programs that you're talking about. I do want to mention uh, for anyone who doesn't know, this is uh, Commissioner Jesse Poole who is from, uh, represents District 6 on the west side of Athens. And I'm sure he would love to talk to any and all of you afterwards, too. <laughs> so, um, and uh, thank you, Jesse, for always being a good attender of our uh, deliberation <coughs> forum. So, um, I think we're about ready to wrap up. Oh, wait, wait. Tim and Suki have questions over there. I have a question. I just want to also point out that Mr. Myers is over there. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Sarah Williams is back here to Mr. Myers. I just I want to make sure we have other resources. Oh, sure. Yes, thank you. Tim, did you have a question? Yeah, just, just a quick one on this. So I think one of the things about this conversation, and I appreciate y'all being a part of this, is that we all y'all talked about the why people, why these kids join it, right? Y'all talked about a deficit in people and children's uh, resources or guidance at home, uh, their parents being overwhelmed, housing, all these things. Um, and you know, I don't think any of y'all said anything about like you know uh, these kids, people join these gangs because they're bad people. I don't think y'all believe that. We don't believe that, right? But if we look at the way we actually tackle uh, gang prevention in our society, it's much more towards that ladder of uh, you know it's it, it's a uh, you know throw the book out kind of thing. Um, as we see, like, saw this legislation come through uh, that we're just going to look like we're going to look at prosecuting them as hard as possible. When I think all of you all have kind of pointed out that it's more about a lack of resources, a lack of attention, a lack of uh, again a deficit in these people's lives. Um, so I my question is, and I hope that we can take more of a case management kind of you know take it at doing gain prevention, which I think might be more uh, workable. But so my question to y'all is, do y'all feel like our um, our style on gain prevention? In this community and also across the state nationally, is the correct one. Uh, and if not, what do y'all think we should be doing instead? Of? So I would say this, and I, and I left this out. There is a percentage that are actually born into it. Mm -hmm. My father was, his father was, and that's just the way it's going to be. And you don't have a choice. There is no right plan because you have to adapt to the moment, right? You have to adapt to the community. What we do here may not be successful in Dunwoody, or it may be not be successful in, in College Park, but it works for us. And we're forever adjusting, um, we're always adjusting, trying to fill, fill out. Uh, SROs are important, but SROs don't work for everybody, okay? Uh, community engagement works, but it doesn't work for everybody. So it's gonna be a multitude of different techniques until we get the right technique, and we may never get the right technique because every human being is different. What I would say is um, I 100% support anything we could do to try to help these kids before they get in there and offer, like Mocha said, for not only kids but their family. And what can we do to prevent them to get in there? But once they've got a gun in their hand and they're shooting up in people's houses, we've got to get dangerous, those dangerous situations off the streets and then look at rehabilitation and things of that nature and support of when they're coming out and their systems for restorative justice. But the, the challenge is we have to keep this community safe. And when it gets to that level with firearms, we've we got to take action. So, um, Wait, what was the question again? No. Um, the... Are we addressing it as, as effectively as we can? I, I couldn't tell you, but the just, you know, my, my experience in this is largely anecdotal and from just this community, um, the little bit of, I guess, you know, in, in conferences or research that I've done on my own, it, it seems to be that there's terrible data on this issue because it's very hard to study. Um, and um, so th I don't think that 
we're stupid for not having good, you know, answers. And 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 there is not no one has come up with a good, you know, solution um, to reducing the kind of childhood trauma that would, you know, keep this this going. Um, the so from my point of view in the courts, um, there it's almost become a an insult to talk about restorative justice in some circles. And, but the, the fact of the matter is, the truth is that that's not happening. There is no restorative justice in place in the courts in Clark County. Um, there are people who are capable of doing it um, at the Georgia Conflict Center, for example, um, here in Athens. Um, and they have mechanisms in place and they have you know t met with juvenile court um, but it the the DA's office has not enacted it for whatever has not you know followed through with any of that um, despite what might be on Facebook or in the news or I don't know what on both sides I mean some people are claiming look at what the DA's office is doing with restorative justice and other people are using it as a weapon, saying the DA's office is bad. They're using restorative justice, and I'm, and a few others that are actually in the courtrooms are like, actually, it's not happening at all. And it <laughs> probably is a good idea. I'd love to see if it worked, um, but nobody's doing it. And there are very um, well-trained, committed people ready to go. So that's the only thing I can think of that that we could try. Just a quick comment on that as far as with the Georgia Complex Center and the restorative justice model. Both parties have to agree to be a part of that program. And so, so far I believe the DA's office has only had like one case where both individuals have. And again, I, I see you shaking your head and I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but that's, I'm not. Like, that's the way that I am. That's my understanding too. Both parties have to agree, absolutely, yes. Um, but I don't think that, um, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's being pursued very vigorously. No, that's what I'm saying. I'm in the DA's office. And so what I was told is that there is an instance, there are a couple of instances where it was pursued and so far only one case has been pursued. And so the DA has Are there adults or juvenile? I'm sorry? Is it adults or juvenile? Like what, what, what court? What level of this? Oh, I believe it's juvenile, but I would have to confirm. And I'll just comment that one of the last, um, I think it was the forum at the library where I think Ms. Gonzalez was asked about the sort of justice. She said it's only being right now started in juvenile court. And a lot of this, we do see gang activity starting in juvenile court. However, um, I think what Mr. Donnelly was referring to is it needs to still help as adults. Yeah, I don't think I did say that, did clarify, but, but right, I mean, in Georgia, 17-year-olds are treated as adults in criminal court. Okay, one more question. Go ahead. Logan, you talked about the importance of uh, seeing it in your children. Is there some kind of training? Can you do the training? I, c I mean, I will miss a gang sign. I'm learning about some of this stuff, too. You know, um, I do believe, I do believe the internet and um, the portal that you have for the internet is definitely making it easier for to reach these kids. So officer chambers, they specialize in teaching this, they work it, they do it, they see it in different forms and shape because I'm telling you is, is just because everybody have on red, that don't mean they're a part of a gang. There's other things that you have to be able to recognize, and that is not my expertise. I'm not sure, Officer Chambers. Dr. Train, but uh, Deputy Chief said we can offer stuff like this to the citizens of. Well, yeah. couldn't that be an easy way for us to start? Well, I mean, I've, done it, I've done it with the school district. I've offered it with them. Uh, it's very insightful for them. So, I mean, you reach out to me, I give you my car, and when we offer it to them, I'll see if it's all right. We can make it a more form that we can have.
have some little rules, of course, to it, uh, so you can learn, like work sessions. But like I tell you, all work sessions are very expensive. Uh, so that being said, I expect you to bring me a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I live by this slogan. People can only do to you what you allow. They're doing what they want to do to our kids because we're allowing it because we're not addressing it. We have resources here to do it together, work as a team, and make a difference. But just understand this. You're never going to stop it, but you can't reduce the behavior. You can make it so uncomfortable that they don't want to be here. That's what you want to end. And then when we prosecute it, we're prosecuting it from a, a community aspect. We're telling you this behavior will not be tolerated. So you have to adjust and do better or move it to somewhere else. I just want to thank you all for, for the great questions and a great forum tonight. Um, I guess my hope is I, I don't want to experience what we experienced a few weeks ago, and that's been my fear is we've seen shooting incidents rise right now. We're at a low from this time last year, and my commitment to you as a community is we're going to do everything we can, um, but it's going to take – the village. It's going to take the entire community to work together to solve these these issues. But I don't want to see another situation like we had last week with a five year old being shot, or even looking at the two homicides we've had this year, both being young African American males. We we have to come together as a community. It, it's not a police problem. It's not a government problem. It's a community problem. So that's the only way we're going to solve it's by working together. Thank you. Yep, and. Um if you are a member of a gang, you're 100 times more likely to be shot than someone who is not in a gang. It's kind of a different way to think about it. Um, and the, you know, working in the courts, it's these situations like, I, you know, we're going to, there's a good chance that we will deal with it on some, in some aspect in the courthouse. And it's, there's so much sadness and pain uh, involved in these situations all around um you know we will be representing a young man who's charged with this and then you know they'll have relatives and family who are uh heart sick and heartbroken about it as well as you know the, this little this child's family um and people just concern people in the community for for either a t you know the, anyway it's uh the courthouse is not a satisfactory place to resolve these issues. I mean, it can only do so much. It's very limited in what it can do. And um, yeah, just want to, I mean, I work there and I'm, I dedicated my, you know, professional career to trying to do what I can there, but it is, it's very limited to um, satisfy the community's, you know, outrage or, or, um, offense at this type of um, activity. I would just say don't judge because a lot of us are judging um, these kids and we're some of us are afraid of them and we're giving up on them. A young black man is 3.5 times more likely to be expelled, suspended from school and ended up in the incarceration system. And it does start from elementary. It's starting from elementary now to where a child can be, an elementary student can be suspended from school or basically arrest depending on what state you live in or where you live. So the, the thing that I want to say is that I see a lot of people judge. You judge these kids, people judge me. Stop judging because they're already a young black man and a young black woman. We're already walking around knowing that supposedly we're a threat. They maneuver differently. Some of them will see people and automatically cross the streets. So what I'm trying to tell you is be more of a servant. Try to see what you can do to help instead of judging and condemning this young person. Because believe me, you think that you just walked away from it. For every bed in that jail, you have to pay tax dollars. So you are ultimately can be a part of the problem and you can also be a part of the solution. But judging somebody and not seeing what you can do to offer help, stop, stop that. Cause it's not gonna help us. <laughs>